Okay, welcome everyone. Let's get started today. I'd like to welcome you to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olewski, the webinar host, but I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And today's webinar is sinuses and vasculitis, vasculitis with our speaker, Dr. Brent Sr. This is a live webinar, but it'll be recorded and will be added to the Vasculitis Foundation's YouTube channel as soon as it is uploaded. All of you who registered for today's webinar will receive a link to it in an email from the Vasculitis Foundation. And just, I'm gonna go over just a few housekeeping details before we get started. Because this is a live webinar, we have muted everyone except Dr. Senior and myself. And also at the end of, at the end of his presentation, Dr. Senior is going to take questions from our live audience, but the way that we'll do that is have you enter your questions in the Q&A box. So this is a good time to look across the bottom of your screen for a Q&A box. If you don't see it, you can click on the word that says more with the three dots and you will you should see it. should see it there. And one more thing, during the presentation, we plan to introduce a few polls today. So right before the presentation, that's what we're gonna do. It will we'll show you the poll on the screen and give our audience a chance to select an answer from the choices. And then I'm gonna share the results with all of you. So now that our housekeeping is done, let me introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Brent Sr. has served as the Chief of the Division of Rhinology, Allergy, and Endoscopic Skull-Based Surgery at UNC since 2008, where he is also a professor in the school's neurosurgery department. He is the Vice Chairman of Clinical Affairs in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and specializes in endoscopic, minimally invasive management of sinusitis. CSF rhinorrhea and tumors of the anterior skull base, as well as surgical management of sleep apnea and snoring. And I hope I pronounced all those words correctly, Dr. Senior, and welcome today. Well, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no complaints. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then what we're going to do is we're going to start by sharing a poll today and see if we can let everybody get into the poll and take a question or two with us. So I'm gonna put the first one up. This one is, do you have sinus involvement? So let's see what everybody says that's uh, watching with us today. We'll just give a little bit of time for 91 of you to answer. Very good, we are at 88%. I'm pleased that so many of you have answered, great job. And I'm going to end the poll now so that we can share the results with Dr. Senior and see what he thinks. So just one second. And there are the results. Can you see them, Dr. Senior? I do, I do. Yeah, I think we self-selected though, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah. I guess if people didn't have uh, sinus involvement, you may not be paying attention to this webinar today, so. Correct. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna move on to the second poll. See if I can do this. I'm sort of talented in this area. All right, there. Uh, here we have one. It says, have you seen an otolaryngologist on a regular basis? That's because so many of you answered yes to the first one. All right, we're coming along good. We are at almost 90% of you have answered, and that's our goal because that's what we got a few minutes ago. Oh, we're even above that a little bit. All right, I'm going to end the poll now so that we can share the results. Here we go, and can you see those results, Dr. Senior? I, I do, I do. It kind of it kind of breaks my heart just a little bit. Right, well- but but I got to say, not terribly surprising. And, and I think some of that is not just, I think that's a, a problem in the, among the otolaryngology community, as well as just a problem in general um, uh, uh, in vasculitis. I think that uh, maybe we're not doing as good a job being receptive to it uh, in the otolaryngology community. So that's good for me to see. Okay. Well, we are 
done with the poll for today. And now I think it would be great if you would share your screen and start to educate us. All right. You can see that okay? We can. It's great. Well, it's a real it's a real honor. It's a real pleasure for me to be able to to do this uh, webinar here this evening. Uh, vasculitis is such a such a, a big part of my practice, and it's something I've been really uh, proud to be involved with uh, for the last uh, twenty years or so uh, here at UNC. And what I want to do here over the next uh, few minutes is is spend some time introducing you to the sort of the idea and the, and the manifestations of of head and neck vasculitis. What is it that we're looking for uh, when we're doing an examination? Uh, in our patients that uh, have vasculitis. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the treatments uh, that we recommend very commonly for uh, vasculitis involving the head and neck. So I'm going to start out talking just a little bit about GPA. Um, and that's what the bulk of my discussion here today is going to be about, uh, that type of vasculitis specifically, just because we see that so much more commonly in the head and neck. So a lot of this will apply to other forms of vasculitis, but GPA is the primary one that we'll be focused on. As many of you probably know, uh, it was originally named after uh, Wegner, uh, who described a condition that was called rhinogenic granulomatosis. Um, so the thing that uh, I like about that name is that it's rhinogenic, emphasizing the fact that it really does present and, and manifest itself in the nose and sinuses. And this was recognized from the very beginning in 1939. To be fair, when you dig into the history a little bit, it probably was described uh, clinically by others prior to 1939, and maybe even as early as the 1890s in some cases. We know demographically it occurs in all age groups, including children. Men and women tend to be pretty equally affected. And to date, we don't have any particular causative agent or factor that's been identified. And that's where I live my life right there. So Wegner's, or, or more appropriately, granulomatosis with polyangiitis uh, is a granulomatous disease. So, so that means when we look under the microscope, we see that it's composed histologically of very specific immune cells, macrophages, macrophages, multinucleated giant cells. But there's also these epithelioid cells as well. And it's a combination of these that defines the histologic appearance of this disease. And the thing that's really interesting about, about this is the fact that it really, as a granulomatous disease, is a country cousin to many other diseases, such as sarcoidosis, tuberculosis. It actually has some similar appearances on histology. Leprosy. How is that? That's a crazy one has a similar appearance. Syphilis, you probably don't want to know that, but that actually has some similar appearance as well. A disease called rhinoscleroma, which is a, a, a disease of the nose and sinuses that's uh, uh, caused by a particular type of bacteria and occurs in particularly in Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, and in fungal infections as well. So all of these conditions actually have a bit of a, a, a uh, relationship uh, to vasculitis and, and uh, GPA. But in addition to this being a granulomatous disease, it's also a vasculitis. So what is a vasculitis? Well, itis in medicine refers to any inflammation, right? So vasculitis is going to be an inflammation of blood vessels. And specifically in GPA, we see it impacting smaller uh, blood vessels in the body. And that's where it causes damage to lungs, kidneys, and um, the head and neck and, and the sinuses uh, specifically. And it occurs, of course, in combination or in isolation. And of course, we also know that it can impact other structures in the body, other organs in the body, such as the skin, the joints, the eyes, the heart the nervous system. So anywhere we see these smaller blood vessels, 
potentially can be impacted by the vasculitis, by the inflammation in the blood vessel. So how often does GPA occur in the head and neck? Well, this is a, a big review of, of some large studies, six different studies uh, that discuss GPA system involvement specifically. In this review, they found that the nose and sinuses uh, were involved in somewhere between 80 and 100% of uh, cases. Uh, ears are frequently involved somewhere 20 to 40%, something like that. Eyes are involved somewhere in the 20 to 70% range. So this area here is very, very commonly involved in this disease process. Um, and, and certainly, of course, we know that Lungs are frequently involved. Kidneys are frequently involved. Um, CNS, a little less so, right? The, the uh, nervous system, about 11 to 24%. Joints, also commonly involved. Everyone knows that, right? Um, somewhere in the, in the 50 to 60% range. Skin, somewhere in the 15 to 50%. And heart can be involved upwards of 30% of the time. So this is also uh, interesting data that comes from um, uh, Dr. Rasmussen, who is in uh, Copenhagen. He, he uh, uh, conducted what's called the UVAS study, and um, he's an otolaryngologist looking at uh, manifestations of GPA in the head and neck, and specifically notes these types of symptoms uh, occurring, bloody nasal drainage bloody, crusty nasal drainage, about 50 to 56%, something like that of patients experience this. Frank sinus involvement in somewhere about a third of patients. Subglottic inflammation, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, that's inflammation in the larynx itself, in the voice box itself, about 20% of patients. And conductive hearing loss, the type of hearing loss that is uh, uh, a reversible type of hearing loss, usually involving fluid or stiffness of the ossicles or the, the bones of hearing occurring in about 30% of patients. And when we've looked at uh, our patients at UNC, specifically at University of North Carolina, we see nose and sinus involvement in about 50% of our patients with GPA. So what does GPA look like in the nose and the sinuses? Well, I think a lot of you have seen the, the so-called saddle nose deformity. So this is a common manifestation of GPA in the head and neck area. And this occurs because uh, the septum here in the midline of the nose starts to dissolve away, essentially. So you can think of the nose essentially constructed like a tent. There's a center pole to the tent, and then you have the soft sides of the tent. The septum is in the middle, and it's like the center pole. And if your center pole starts to disintegrate, your tent is going to start to collapse. And that's what we see in the nose uh, here. We see the center of the nose starting to collapse, the septum starting to collapse. That results in the whole nose starting to kind of collapse down. And that's what a saddle nose deformity is. And you can see that it does take on the shape of a saddle, which is what gives it its name, of course. This is the same process that results in a septal perforation. So you've probably heard of a perforation of the septum. That's essentially just a hole forming in the septum. So sometimes the septum can dissolve away a little lower in the nose. It may not be associated with a cosmetic deformity of a saddle nose, but it's still dissolving away in the nasal cavity, and that's what's a sept that's called a septal perforation. In addition, people can develop what's called subglottic stenosis. So here, I don't know if you can see my little cursor. Can you see my cursor on the screen as I move it? Yeah. So right below the voice box, right way down here on this little picture, this is the area of the subglottis. So the subglottis is below the glottis. The glottis is another name for the vocal folds. Below the glottis <laughs> is a little area um, that for whatever reason, and we have no idea why, 
tends to be involved with vasculitis and it results in scar tissue forming. So this picture right here is a picture below the vocal folds. This is a, a vocal fold and this is a vocal fold. And the scope is just at the level of the vocal folds and we're looking down the windpipe. This area here is called the subglottis. And this you can see is scarred. There's a little tiny opening here and that is subglottic stenosis. And what this results in when a person experiences this is they have breathing, noisy breathing, both breathing in and breathing out. And we call this biphasic strider. So both phases of breathing, biphasic strider is another name for noisy breathing. So that's what results when you have subglottic stenosis. You have biphasic strider. So I wanted to show you a little bit more what the image is, what a CAT scan of a patient with sinus involvement uh, with GPA looks like. So this, this is a little pictogram that I stole off the internet that kind of basically shows the position of the sinuses in the face. And the face is actually full of sinuses. You don't even appreciate the fact that your whole face is basically filled with sinus, okay? And these are basically empty chambers that occupy the facial structures. We don't know why we have them. Uh, we, do, we know that they provide some resonance to the voice. We know that they provide some safety when you have an impact to the face. If you have a fracture to the face, it's almost like a crumple zone, like on the front of a car, where cars are designed to actually have, have crumple zones where they, they protect the passengers in the car. It's, the face almost does the same thing with the sinuses when there's impact on the front of the face. But suffice it to say, it's important to know that sinuses occupy the entire facial structure. So this is the pictogram, and then this is what a CT scan of your face looks like. And this is a patient who has a little bit of sinusitis. They have a little inflammation here in their cheek sinus, but for the most part, this is a pretty normal appearing sinus cavity. So these pictures look at you. So this is your right eye here. This is your left eye here. And this area here is the brain, all right? And so here's the area below the brain, between the eyes, and this is a sinus cavity. And it goes all the way down here. This is down in the cheek area. This is the cheek area on the right. So all of this area, between the eyes, below the eyes, above the eyes, these are all sinuses. And this is a fairly normal appearance. This black is air. And so we want the sinuses to appear black and we want just these little thin gray lines. The sinuses are almost like a honeycomb up there in the way that they're shaped. And so these little thin gray lines are actually little bony septations. And when the sinuses are not inflamed, they have this very thin, fine appearance. This is a fairly healthy looking sinus cavity. Now compare that to this. You can see pretty quickly that this looks very, very different. And as, an, as a, a head and neck surgeon, as a, a, a sinus specialist, the thing I notice right away is a very unusual combination of absence of bone where I expect to see bone, but then in other places I see thickening of bone where we don't expect to see thickening of bone. So it's a weird combination where the bone is kind of melting away in the sinuses and in other places in the sinuses, it's getting thicker and thicker. So it's a very, very odd picture, but a very characteristic picture of GPA vasculitis. And in fact, that's what this is a CT scan showing. This is GPA vasculitis. And we see here all of this. This is a patient who's never had surgery, but all of those thin gray lines that we see here are completely absent. They're gone and, and they've just disappeared because the bony structure is just sort of dissolving away. And this is from that inflammation in the blood vessels. The blood vessels are inflamed. They're not bringing the blood flow, the oxygen supply to the structures in the nose and the sinuses. And so the nose and the sinuses literally start dying. 
and they start dissolving away. And that's what we're seeing here with loss of all of these structures because of the lack of blood flow and the lack of uh, 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 oxygen supply. The interesting thing though also is that there are parts for whatever reason that get thickened as well, just like this here, this area below the eye on the patient's left side. And we suspect this is just related to inflammation that the body is reacting uh, to inflammation in the nose and sinuses, and it's causing that bone to thicken as a result of that. But it's this combination of loss of bone and thickening of bone that's very, very unique in vasculitis in the nose and sinuses. So why does it happen this way? Well, again, we don't know exactly for sure why it happens, but again, it appears to be basically a result of loss of blood supply. That really appears to be the root of the, the problem when it comes to the changes that we see manifesting in the nose and sinuses. And the problem is that once the tissue is gone, once that tissue has died, it's gone forever. It doesn't regrow for the most part. So so once the sinus structure is gone, it's gone. And, and so that's the problem that we deal with in, in vasculitis. Now, here's a question for you. And I can't, I can't see it because you can't, you know, I can't see the responses from everyone. This is, this is a really interesting thing. So how many of you, when you go, went to go see the otolaryngologist, the ear, nose, throat doctor for your nose and sinus problem, how many of them asked you if you use cocaine in your life? Yeah, I bet a lot of you were asked that question. And I bet a lot of you were kind of offended by it, right? Like, what are you talking about? Why would I? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a person who uses cocaine. What do you think? Well, so here's the reason. And it's a very reasonable thing. It's because amazingly, cocaine use in the nose and the sinuses People that use cocaine, their nose looks almost the same as a patient with vasculitis. That's the crazy part. That CT scan that I show you right here, this could easily be a patient who's using cocaine chronically just as much as it can be GPA vasculitis. So that's the reason that your doctor asked you that question. It wasn't because they were trying to offend you in any way. <laughs> But it oftentimes, surprisingly, looks similar. That's the reason, and that's why they asked you that question. And just so you know, this is actually a picture of, of um, uh, again, something I stole off the internet. It's uh, supposedly the coca uh, uh, that produces the cocaine. So this is what um, how GPA is, is diagnosed uh, on, on a microscope. And and I'm not a I'm not an expert at this part. I don't know really the difference to me. I look at these little green blobs and they kind of look the same to me. But it's this immunofluorescent staining uh, that our that our pathologists use to make the diagnosis of both C anca and P anca, or PR3 anca and MPO anca. Um, so that's that. This is the pattern that they're looking at. Um, I find that they're just pretty pictures. So that's one of the reasons I always put it in my talk. All right, so what is the breakdown of ANCA vasculitis, PR3 versus MPO when it comes to involvement of the head and neck? Well, the bottom line here, uh, this is a complicated graph, I know, but the bottom line is that people with head and neck involvement with ANCA disease, with vasculitis, tend to be more PR3 or GPA type of vasculitis, all right? It's not always, but it just tends to be more often that we see that relationship. MPO type vasculitis tends to be more commonly associated with maybe kidney limited disease. We see it in Churk, Strauss, uh, microscopic uh, polyangiitis as well, PAN, Vasculitis, Wegener's granulomatosis in China also tends to be MPO, which is kind of interesting. But the bottom line is, is it in the U.S. in our American population, for the most part, we see PR3 type ANCA vasculitis associated with head and neck involvement. 
So one of the things that that oftentimes your doctor will want to do, your otolaryngologist will want to do when they see a new septal perforation, a patient who comes in with a, a septal perforation and we don't know what's causing it, it's never been noticed before, oftentimes your doctor is going to suggest a biopsy it. And, and it's one of the reasons that we do this is because there's a lot of other things that can cause a, a perforation of the septum. Um, we see uh, uh, all kinds of things, including very rarely cancers of the nose and sinuses that contribute to this uh, picture as well. So the really interesting thing, though, is that very commonly when you biopsy uh, the perforation, you actually don't identify vasculitis even if vasculitis is the cause. And it's a real conundrum for us. It's a real challenge for us who deal with this on a regular basis because the truth is, is that it's just rare or very uncommon for a biopsy to prove in the nose and sinus area to prove that you have vasculitis. This is our data that we have from UNC uh, that we published. And we noted that for patients with MPA, none of our patients actually had a diagnostic uh, biopsy from the nose and sinuses. With GPA, about half of the patients when we did a biopsy actually showed uh, evidence of vasculitis. So the bottom line is, is it's frequently in the head and neck, it's really hard to confirm that in fact, we're dealing with GPA. We can look at the CT scan, we can look at the endoscopy, we can look at the patient, and we can say, you look all the world like you have GPA. But lo and behold, the biopsies that we do in that area may not show anything and may not confirm that we have GPA. So it may be that your doctor will want to do multiple biopsies. So they get no biopsy result initially, and they try to do more biopsies. Yeah, it actually doesn't really change anything. Oftentimes, again, oftentimes... The, the results of the biopsy will be negative. But I always encourage, when I talk to other rhinologists, otolaryngologists, I always still encourage people to do the biopsy. And again, it's not so much always to confirm the presence of GPA, but it's actually to rule out other things that mimic or appear like GPA. And that would be things like lymphoma as an example. So that's a big reason that your doctor is going to want to do a biopsy in your nose. I imagine many of you have heard of this, this concept of limited GPA. Um, limited GPA is, is, has been strictly defined by uh, the rheumatologists. It's manifestations of vasculitis that pose no immediate threat to either the patient's life or the function of a vital organ. Now, that's the diagnosis. That's the diagnosis that came out of the uh, uh, rheumatology, um, American College of Rheumatology. And I got to say, don't let any of them know, but I'm kind of offended by it. It kind of like drives me crazy when I read this. And the reason is because um, when people hear limited v GPA, it poses no immediate threat to the person's to the person's life or the function of a vital organ, they think it's not that big a deal. It's no big deal. You got limited GPA, no big deal. Well, when you have limited GPA in the head and neck, and it's very common that Wegner's is limited to the head and neck area, that's not a minor thing. And it can cause horrendous problems for patients. But unfortunately, because it has that moniker of limited and we define it as having no big threat to the patient's life, doctors as well as patients may kind of poo-poo it. They may kind of ignore it a little bit or treat it like it's just not that big a deal. And so they may choose, for example, to not treat you with the immunosuppression that you may benefit from to help control the symptoms in your head and neck area. So this is a this is kind of something that I I have to deal with and I I kind of talk about a lot because limited GPA doesn't mean it doesn't deserve a full evaluation and significant treatment. That's really really important. Typically in limited GPA we say uh, oftentimes presents at a younger age group uh, 
as a, as a result of it presenting earlier, it's going to tend to have a longer disease duration as well. And oftentimes you have greater frequency of exacerbations and limited GPA. We certainly see that in the head and neck as well. Uh, and again, here highlighted in red, higher rates of destructive upper airway disease at presentation, i.e. involvement of the, of the nose and sinuses with the nasal crusting discharge sinus involvement. And again, less likely uh, to have C anca or P anca positivity. So this is, this is starting to get into a real conundrum here. So limited GPA is less likely to actually have a positive serum ANCA level. But I also just told you that head and neck vasculitis is unlikely to have a positive biopsy. So that's the a big problem because we have a fairly sizable population of patients that have clinical GPA. They have the appearance in their nose and sinuses of GPA. They have everything that I see when I look in them looking like they have GPA, but their biopsy is negative and their serum workup for ANCA is negative. How do we treat those patients? What do we do in those situations? And that's that can be a real problem for us, a real conundrum. But the point is, and again, this is an emphasis that I make to all of my non-otolaryngology colleagues as well, you still have to think about vasculitis. ANCA itself, biopsy itself, in and of themselves, do not define this disease. This disease is a clinical disease, and while these things help us to define the disease, they don't confirm or deny the, the disease. And so vasculitis can absolutely be present with no positive biopsy and with a negative ANCA study. All right, so this is what your otolaryngologist is going to do when you come to the clinic to be examined for the first time. They're going to do an otoscope exam, so they're going to look inside your ear, and this is what your ear looks like uh, when you look in with the little scope, and this happens to be a patient who has some fluid behind the eardrum. See the little bubbles there? If you look carefully there, you see little bubbles behind the eardrum, and so that's, that's fluid. That's causing a conductive hearing loss, and that's not uncommon in, in vasculitis. We see that actually fairly fairly commonly. The good news is, is that oftentimes will settle down on its own and not require any specific treatment, but occasionally it could require tubes or maybe even a little more extensive operation on the ear in patients who have very significant uh, inflammation there. Of course, we're going to look at the, the externally, look at the nose. We're going to look with a speculum in the front of the nose as well. So you're Otolaryngologists of a certain age may have a little head mirror over their head. Uh, more commonly, the uh, uh, folks will wear a little light, a headlight over their head, and they're going to look in, in the front of the nose with a little speculum. But the truth is, is, it's really hard to see very much when you look in the front of the nose like that. So we, we tend to uh, uh, focus on our scope exams and look inside the nose and the sinus area with our scopes uh, to give us a better view of things. It is very common when you look with a speculum to be able to see a septal perforation. Some of these problems that I described with the septum, you can tell from the front of the nose. So you don't need to be a rhinologist or an otolaryngologist to identify those things. But certainly to see some of the other changes in the sinuses, you got to look deeper and you got to look with a scope exam. Looking in the mouth, we want to look uh, at the back of the throat area here. This is the uvula and the palate. And people with vasculitis are susceptible when they have nose and, and sinus involvement. They can have palatal involvement as well. And what does that mean? This is the hard palate here. This is the soft palate here. And a person can actually, just like they develop a hole in their septum, they can develop a hole in their palate as well. And it's the same thing. It's loss of blood supply. It's weakening of those tissues and those tissues just slowly dying away. And that results in a, in a hole forming there. And that can result in speech problems. It can result in swallowing problems. So again, very important to identify those. Again, we can look with a, a head mirror and a light um, 
down at the voice box as well. Um, it doesn't give us quite the good of, as good a view as when we use a scope, but your doctor may choose to do that. And that's not terribly uncommon. But again, um, I feel like oftentimes uh, we get a little misled by our speculum exam or our headlight examination. And we need to use our, get the technology out to be able to see a little bit better. And that's where we get our scopes. We both we use both flexible scopes and rigid scopes, uh, depending on the scenario. So your doctor may uh, use one or possibly both of those scopes to examine you. And, and what I thought I'd do is I wanted to show you um, what uh, an endoscopic exam of the nose anyway looks like and what this involves. And the reason that this particular individual is looking quite shocked there is because this individual is doing this exam to himself, as amazingly as that may sound. Uh, so yeah, I actually uh, put the scope in and looked around myself in my own nose. So this is what it looks like here. So this is my right side, but here's the interesting side, left side. This is called the inferior turbinate here. This is the middle turbinate right here. And we're looking between the inferior and the middle turbinates, and that's right here on the diagram. And now we're looking back in the nasopharynx, which is right here. So this is using a flexible scope. So we kind of feather the scope in the nose, and we're looking here at this middle turbinate, this inferior turbinate, the space between the inferior and the middle turbinates. It's called the middle meatus. And one of the reasons we look there is because that's where the business of the sinuses are. The sinuses actually all drain into this middle meatus area. So we always want to look in this area to see if there's evidence of inflammation or infection. And then finally, we look in this nasopharynx area here, which is at the backmost area of the nose. But interestingly, this is exactly the area where the eustachian tube or the tube to the ears drain. And so vasculitis can involve this area. And that's one of the reasons people develop fluid behind their ears. So that was a, a reasonably normal exam. Um, so this is what an endoscopic exam of the nose and the sinuses look like in a patient with vasculitis. So they have active vasculitis, all right? So you can tell there's a lot of abnormality here, right? This is crusting in the nose or, or uh, uh, and this is where the, there's no septum here. The septum is dissolved away again. And now we're back. This is the what's left of the septum actually back there. And then back here, where I just gave you a little glimpse, is actually the nasopharynx. And here we go. Here's a hole in the palate. This is a hole in the floor of the nose that's going down into the mouth. All right, so that's a palatal perforation as well. So all of this is evidence of very active, destructive vasculitis. Now, here's a crazy thing. This patient, negative anca, negative biopsy. Crazy as that sounds, but we know this is obviously vasculitis. There's no question in our in in my mind that this is vasculitis and so this needs to be treated as vasculitis and very aggressively despite the fact it was limited disease so that's looking at the nose and the sinuses but your doctor is also going to want to look at the larynx look down at the voice box and so what we do for that is we take that same flexible scope and we look through the nose and then we curve it down into the back of the throat we make a right angle here and we look down at the back of the throat and then we're going to look into the, the voice box area like this. So let me show you how that looks. So we're looking into the nasopharynx and then we just made the turn. And this is part of this is your voice box right here. All right. So there's your vocal folds that come together. And these are called the arytenoids that bring your vocal folds together. And there's phonation. And now, again, I told you before that the area that we're most concerned about with vasculitis is actually right below the vocal folds. So sometimes your doctor will kind of beat you up a little bit and try to sneak the endoscope down 
between the vocal folds to look into the windpipe, into the trachea, into the subglottic area. And that's this is the subglottis, and this is the area that can be in, become involved with scar and get narrowed in vasculitis and cause subglottic stenosis. So that's a good, healthy-looking subglottis there. All right, so what do we do for treatment? What are some options for treatment? Well, um, one thing that's important to know is that basically all head and neck involvement tends to improve when you give systemic medications. So the same types of medications that your doctor is going to offer you for you know, kidney involvement, for lung involvement, uh, different immunosuppression uh, medication regimens, including prednisone, including things like rituximab, cytoxan, imuran, all of those potentially have some benefit in the head and neck area as well. So, and sometimes they just work the best for the head and neck as well. So we encourage systemic treatment when the head and neck is involved, when the sinuses are involved, for example. When there's intranasal involvement and sinus involvement, an absolute, absolute need, an important thing to be doing is irrigations. Irrigations are so critical. Washing out the, that gunk that builds up in there is really, really important to your overall health. And it's, I believe, important to kind of helping to control your disease. So yes, it can help you to feel a little bit better, but I actually have a belief that it impacts the, the, uh, the disease and how the disease progresses. So I really encourage people to be rinsing on a regular basis. Um, and I'm pretty open. I'm pretty agnostic as to the different types of rinses you can choose. This is the, the sinus rinse bottle, which is the little squeeze bottle about the size of a can of Coke. If you haven't used this, this is the neti pot, which is like the little teapot. All these things can potentially give you some benefit. Um, I think the point is just doing something is important. Um, I do typically like a normal saline solution. So that's a saline solution that is at the same concentration as your own body fluids. Uh, and, and the nice thing about these, these Neomed sinus rinse bottles is they come with these little salt packets that are exactly the right concentration to, to create a normal saline solution. Um, this is something I've, I've come to start using more recently, the, something that has a little xylitol additive. Xylitol is, a, is a, a naturally occurring sugar, which actually helps to break up the mucus in the nose, and it helps break up some of the crusts that people develop. So I do tend to favor uh, people using uh, this xylitol uh, in their saline rinse as well. You can, this is a home uh, recipe if you want to use this recipe. Um, but again, I typically favor just buying the pre-packaged uh, saline packets since I know that the concentration will be right. Um, you know, the, it's, the sinus rinse is a kind of a funny thing and people you know, aren't real accustomed to doing it. And so it can be a little uncomfortable when you first do it, but after a little while, it becomes kind of second nature. And so you just get used to it and, and people really do kind of like doing it. Uh, this is one of my, uh, so when you're a professor in med school, you can make your medical students do things. And, uh, and this is, uh, my, my student actually uh, doing a sinus irrigation here. Um, it is important to be doing it frequently, at least a couple times a day. I, I suggest it's important to clean your bottle. I do recommend wiping the bottle uh, with alcohol after you've used it so you don't transmit infection into the nose and sinuses. And we do recommend sterile water uh, be used for the mixture. And this is because of the extremely uncommon and unlikely chance that you could have a very unusual amoebic infection that develops as a result of uh, irrigating your nose and sinuses. It's been reported a handful of times in the United States um, related to tap water or well water being used for your solution. So in order to prevent that, we do recommend sterile or distilled water uh, for your saline solution. It provides a lot of moisture for your nose and sinuses, and it does debride the sinuses as well. Uh, it's very much, I, I argue, it's very much akin to brushing your teeth. You know, it helps to just keep your keep your nose clean. And that's really important to your nasal sinus health. There's a, these newer systems that maybe some of you have seen. This is a mechanical battery operated system called the Navage. This one um, 
is a little bit harder to use for patients, I think, with vasculitis because of the abnormal anatomy. But it's basically uh, pushing the fluid in one side and sucking it out the other side. And when you don't have a septum, that can be really hard to do. Um, but that's what this system does. Some people prefer it. I don't have a, 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 a strong preference, but again, typically a little harder to use in, for my vasculitis patients. So not something I typically recommend. Um, antibiotic washes are frequently recommended as well. So in addition to the salt water, your doctor may recommend putting a little bit of antibiotic into the salt water. And one of the most common ones that, that doctors will recommend is called mupirocin. Mupirocin is an antibiotic that's really potent against staph. And when we culture those crusts that we see in the nose and sinuses, very commonly staph is the culprit. So that's the reason that they'll recommend that. And that oftentimes does help. You can do this yourself and take a tube of the of the mupirocin and 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 squeeze it like a toothpaste into your rinse. But I I prefer honestly to just compound it and have my my colleagues at the compounding pharmacy provide it for my patients. I it tends to mix a lot better and it tends to be a lot less messy. Um, so that's a common way that we recommend. Sometimes your doctor will recommend oral antibiotics if there's a lot of inflammation in the sinuses and that can be quite helpful. There's controversy about intranasal steroids in uh, the setting of vasculitis involving the head and neck. I'm not a big fan, to be truthful. I do think that there's good evidence that use of things like Flonase and Nasacort and Nasonex can increase the amount of staph in your nose. And so we don't want staph in the nose in head and neck vasculitis. And so I tend to shy away from their use. Uh, uh, and, and I do think it's, a, it's just better to focus on just rinsing alone. How often do we do surgery for head and neck involvement with vasculitis? Well, I would say almost never, truthfully. We don't want to do surgery if we can avoid it. It oftentimes results in a lot of scar. I told you there's issues with blood supply and, and that means healing is not good. It can be a real issue. So the bottom line is your surgeon is gonna want to try to avoid doing surgery. When we talk about trying to repair a, a septum, like a saddle nose deformity or a septal perforation, I think most of us would argue that the vasculitis has to be very, very quiescent, has to be under excellent control for at least six months, something like that, before um, anyone would consider doing any sort of an operation. So that's important to consider as well. We also recommend if the larynx is involved, GERD management. GERD is a real common problem. It can make the scarring in the voice box area much worse. Humidification can be helpful as well. And then in rare emergency situations where that scarring in the voice box area gets so extreme, a patient may have to undergo an emergency tracheotomy. Thankfully, very, very rare, but occasionally does happen. This is a technique that, that um, head and neck surgeons will oftentimes use to deal with the subglottic narrowing. They have this, uh, um, these special mechanical instruments that can, that can actually trim away some of that narrowing. Sometimes the laser, this is a laser being used in the head and neck area. Sometimes this uh, can also be used to help open that area up. And this is what it looks like in the operating room. We actually have special instruments and special devices to actually reach the voice box and we can open those little areas of scar and open the, vo uh, the windpipe as a result. So just to, to conclude, uh, GPA does occur throughout the head and neck, uh, has a greater manifestation there than basically any other part of the body. Diagnosis does require a real detailed exam, and that's gonna be a nasal exam, Oftentimes an endoscopic exam, a nasopharyngoscopy as well will be very helpful for your doctor. And treatment of head and neck GPA involves immunosuppression, just like for the kidney, just like for the lungs, supportive-like treatments, rinsing is really critical as well, as I've told you, and very rarely do we recommend surgery uh, for this. I would also argue that follow-up is really critical to monitoring your GPA disease. And, and, and I like to tell people that, that 
basically the head and neck and in, in the nose and sinuses in particular are almost like a barometer for your GPA. So I think it's important that patients follow up regularly. And I think it's important that they be examined really carefully on a regular basis to get a good idea as to the activity of their GPA disease. All right. So thank you so much. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Well, Dr. Senior, I mean, I think your presentation was so thorough, but honestly, there are loads of questions. <laughs> so we are going to do a short quiz first, and then you can stop sharing your screen now if you like. Uh -huh. We're going to do a short quiz first for everybody, and then we're going to take as many questions as we have. We're wondering, since it is now... 22 minutes after the hour, if you might be able to go a little bit longer if you're restricted on your time. We want to respect I, I, your time. Yeah, no problem, of course. I, I know I went long. I'm sorry about that. No oh, problem. no, you didn't. It was so thorough. It was wonderful. Yeah. Okay, I am actually going to share my screen now. And I hope everybody can see that at this point. You can see that screen, Dr. Senior? I do. Recognize that nose by chance? I've... I've my May I think it's an outstanding looking nose. <laughs> so it's okay, one, of my first, one of my favorites. <laughs> the first question is, what is another medical name for the nostrils? I'll let you all look at that. Would it be rhino, rhinopharynx, vestibular airway, or nares? And the answer is, let's see. If I, I can't get to the answer. <laughs> I can tell you the answer. There it is. <laughs> Did I say that right? Nares? It's actually actually Nares. Nares. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Learn, learn something every day. And Is I think that, that was a little unfair because I don't think I actually officially mentioned it in the presentation. You so. did not because I no. didn't do that. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but that's why we're having the quiz. How many groups of sinuses are on each side of the nose? Do we think it's three, four, or five? And the answer is four. Great. I think I was looking at the picture trying to guess that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the picture doesn't actually show the backmost sinus. So it's a little deceiving. That's it why. Is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The next question. What is the most common form of vasculitis that typically affects the sinuses? MPA, Bichette's, EGPA, or GPA? I'm going to guess that we might have learned that today. <laughs> and yes, the answer is GPA. I hope I mentioned that a few times. <laughs> a, few, a few many times, actually. And the next one is a true or false question. Tissue damage from vasculitis in the nose is usually irreversible. And the answer is true. Hmm. That's unfortunate, but yes, it is true. It is, and it was there was something related to that that came up in a couple of the questions, so... Um, and I see that people are answering in the chat box. So that's cool. So thank you for letting me see some of your answers, everybody. And that is the end of our quiz. Unless I've made a mistake, I'm pretty sure that that is correct. Okay, so now what we're going to do is do our best to hit as many questions as we can from our patients that have, uh, there's, I think I counted 37 questions. So uh, one thing I want to say before we get too far into this is if we can't get to all the questions, we do capture them all and we will do our best to get responses for you. And we are going to ask Dr. Senior if he will come back and just do a not live, but a recorded webinar with the other answers if we don't get well, to them. That's a great idea, actually. That okay, we wonderful. All that. Yeah, we have great. had to do that multiple times. All right. Um, next all right, the first question is, in trying to tell the difference between a cold and a flare, is it common for such an increase in sinus mucus production that leads to severe coughing and bronchitis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it is difficult, honestly, to tell the difference, but I wouldn't, I mean, you know, the truth is, is that colds, colds are common. Colds are very common, right? We all experience colds and upper respiratory tract infections that occur, you know, a couple, at least a couple times a year. And certainly patients with vasculitis can get colds as well. So you, I, I never assume that it's going to be a flare necessarily. Um, I always kind of presume that the odds are in the favor of just being a routine cold that'll just get better, but always having some concern in the back of my head. Absolutely. And so do you uh, work through that by seeing your patients regularly? I mean, that was one of my questions because I see my 
for my nephrology issues, I see my doctor every three months. Is that yes. something that you do as well? I do. And I, again, I, I, as I said earlier, I really think it's important that uh, the otolaryngologist be kind of keeping an eye on their patients that have head and neck manifestations of vasculitis. If for no other reason, I think, again, it's a barometer of the disease. I, can, I have frequently caught little flaring areas in the nose and the sinuses, again, where the ankle level hasn't changed, nothing else is changing necessarily, but it definitely can impact the therapy, it definitely impact immunosuppression choices um, based on what we're seeing. So I think it's important, yes. Okay, thank you. How about the next one is, could MPA be causing ocular migraines? I know you talked about GPA most of the time, but that's an interesting question. It is an interesting question because I would argue it's not impossible. How about that as a, a hedging my answer? I think that um, the, the thing with ocular migraines is there's like a thousand different potential contributors to that. And absolutely, if you have uh, uh, something like vasculitis, something like MPA, it absolutely could be a contributor, though it, 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 it wouldn't be the only cause. I mean, it can still, again, just be you know, some other uh, vasospasm type effect that's unrelated to MPA. Okay, here's an interesting one. Is the fluid in the mastoid bone common with GPA? And how do you resolve or eliminate the fluid in the mastoid? Yeah, the, the mastoid is actually just a part of the middle, is a part of the ear. Um, so when that, that little video that I showed you that had the little bubbles, that's fluid in the middle ear. And absolutely, there's fluid in the mastoid as well. Uh, which I didn't show you um, because it's all connected. So oftentimes, if you can get the, the fluid in the middle ear under better control, that will resolve. The mastoid fluid will also resolve. But occasionally, it does require surgeries and things to help control that. So um, it, it really does uh, uh, depend on the patient. But suffice it to say, the two go hand in hand, the middle ear fluid and the mastoid fluid. Okay. And um, a GPA question. This one is, while my ENT diagnosed my GPA with sinus in January 2019, he was not able to determine the root cause. What are some of the causes in your patients? Of GPA in the sinuses? Yeah. I mean, we don't know. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. I mean, it's like, what is what causes GPA in the kidneys? What causes GPA in the lungs? We don't know. We don't know. I just wondered if maybe that patient did not know that, and that's why they asked that question. But the rest, the many of us with vasculitis have learned that we don't know that answer yet. Yeah, hopefully we will, right? Hopefully someday we'll figure this out. But right now it's still a conundrum. We just recognize the problem and thankfully we can treat the problem, but we still don't know what the root cause is. Right. And um, is there a way to find an ENT that is familiar with GPA? My local ENT told me that he doesn't believe I have GPA, even with perforated septum, constant bleeding, numerous positive anti-PR3 lab results, posterior hmm. glottic edema, and my rheumatologist has verified. His reasoning was it isn't in my kidneys. Oh, he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, I think that I think the bottom line is, is that, again, Head and neck involvement uh, is very common, and people can have very isolated involvement in the head and neck with, with the kidneys being normal. We see that all the time. So it absolutely doesn't rule GPA out. Um, but, you know, what I would suggest is um, a lot of my otolaryngology colleagues are very adept at this. If I, I might suggest, and I don't want to offend any of my colleagues, but maybe a, 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 a rhinologist or a person who is specially trained specifically in the nose and sinus area, that's, a, that's an additional fellowship after otolaryngology. And uh, so that would be perhaps somebody that they should seek out to help uh, uh, with that because they would have more experience with it, I would, I would be willing to bet. Good answer. Okay, and how common is anosmia? <laughs> with GPA vasculitis, I have eGPA, diagnosed in 2019, and I lost my sense of smell in 2018. Yeah. So very, very common. And, you know, the nose is, it's, uh, you know, the nose and the ear, I mean, they have, their jobs are kind of um, uh, symmetric, right? The nose is there to smell things as well as to breathe, but it's here to smell things. 
the ear is there to hear things. And so when, when the organ gets affected by disease, the nose by vasculitis or by Church Strauss, as you're describing, the, the ability to smell is going to be impacted. And, and so it isn't uncommon. It's, in fact, I would argue it's very common for patients who have involvement in the nose and sinuses of any cause, whether it's vasculitis, whether it's sinusitis, where it's septal deviation. I mean, there's a, there's a thousand things that happen inside the nose and sinuses, and all of those can impact sense of smell. So yes, a very common problem. Okay, and her follow-up to that was, what is the treatment for vasculitis-related anosmia? Stem cell, are, are there studies I could join? Thank you, is her comment. <laughs> um, I don't know of any studies in vasculitis specifically, but you know, Church Strauss or eosinophilic GPA is a little unique because it has polyps in the nose. So there may actually be a role for surgery in eosinophilic GPA, and there may be a, a, a possible benefit in sense of, mel sense of smell recovery with that surgery. Uh, now, I would never want to promise that to a patient, but that actually is not a terribly unreasonable unreason thing to consider in eGPA specifically. Okay, another eGPA question. Does the CPAP, does use of the CPAP work against eGPA goals? So, yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with CPAP because obviously CPAP is critical to maintaining health when, pers when a person has sleep apnea. I mean, it's just so, so important to, to, to get, keep the oxygen levels appropriate in the patient's body at night. It's important to get a good night's sleep and CPAP works terrific. But it's a completely unnatural way to breathe. And the nose gets completely negatively impacted by it. Um, you know, God didn't design us to have a giant pressure source on the front of our face pushing air into our lungs like that. We're designed actually to, to have a very subtle negative pressure that draws the air in very quietly, and very simply, right? So it's a very, it's almost the opposite of what we're designed to do. And the nose can very, be very negatively impacted. Now, will it cause a flare of vasculation? No, I don't expect that at all. But it can cause congestion. It can cause drainage. It can cause a lot of nagging type symptoms for patients, whether you have vasculitis or not. So it's, it, can be a, it can be definitely an issue. Okay. I, I thank you so much for all of your answers. I was just asked for your um your email address again. And I think it's on our final slide and I just lost the slides and I don't want to keep everybody hanging here. We will put it in the recorded presentation and everybody will get an email link um, from the Vasculitis Foundation with a follow-up email that comes after this. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that I have just dropped the uh, the presentation. So I lost the, the final slide, but as a reminder, the webinar is going to be published on the Vasculitis Foundation's YouTube channel, and each person will get that link by follow-up email. And I did want to say thank you so much for all the time that you spent with us today. Dr. Senior did say he would let me do a recorded webinar with him later answering the other questions. And we, of course, need to thank our sponsors, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis, because they are making these webinars possible for us with the Vasculitis Foundation. So thank you so much, everybody, for participating, and thank you, Dr. Senior. It's a pleasure. Nice to see everyone. You too. Okay, bye, everyone.